There's a place in the world where a lush rainforest, with open meadows, bamboo thickets, and fresh running streams, provides a safe haven for a group of endangered lowland gorillas. In this jungle sanctuary, highly threatened animals survive without fear of being stalked by local poachers. It's a place where the effects of extreme poverty and civil unrest seem a world away. But what really makes this patch of wilderness so extraordinary is the fact that it's not located in a remote part of Africa, but rather here in New York City. The Bronx Zoo's gorilla exhibit is one of the city's most popular attractions, providing visitors with a rare and intimate glimpse of the natural world. However realistic the experience appears, the jungle sounds are pre-recorded. Much of the food the gorillas eat comes from local markets. Many of the trees are made of metal and epoxy. And the forest that lies behind these thick walls of protective glass is essentially a theatrical illusion. What's not an illusion is the approaching reality that the zoos of the future may be forced to become urban sanctuaries for some of our planet's animals. For years, scientists have been telling us that in this century, as many as half of the world's wildlife species could become extinct. Once, not so very long ago, the Earth was a place of great and unspoiled diversity. Home to the rich tapestry and elegance of the natural world. Once, not so very long ago, ours was a world with vast stretches of uninhabited and protected wilderness areas. Where our polar regions supported an abundance of sea and land mammals. And the oceans exhibited a healthy biodiversity. Once, not so very long ago, our tropical rainforests supported an almost infinite variety of species. And the savannas and grasslands of the world sustained great herds of wild and migrating animals. But now, scientific research indicates that something is terribly wrong with our environment. That much of our planet's wildlife is in danger of disappearing. Every kind of species, every broad type of species, every broad type of habitat is under threat now in a way that wasn't true in all of past human history. We've kind of taken over the planet, and there's just not much room left for many of the other species. So we're seeing these extraordinary drops in populations. Right now, we know that at least 25% of the world's 4,000 or so mammal species are threatened or endangered. Two out of three bird species are in decline worldwide. Wildlife extinctions are not a new phenomenon. During our planet's long geological history, on at least five occasions, catastrophic events wiped out vast numbers of species. The last great extinction happened 65 million years ago. That's when a giant asteroid crashed into the Earth, sending enough ash into the atmosphere to cool the planet 
and seal the fate of over 75% of the world's plants and animals. But today, the threat of what scientists call the sixth extinction won't come from a volcanic eruption or outer space. The next extinction could be the result of human activities. We're one of perhaps 100 million species on the planet, but we're the first species ever to have the control of the fates of other species in our hands. There were always side effects from human activities, but they were always small compared to the scale of nature, and now we are altering the planet on the global scale. And while there have been other extinction crises, this will be a dramatic alteration that will fundamentally threaten the future of humanity because we are all linked. We are all part of this web of life. How could we have allowed this to happen? How could many of our planet's animal species be on the brink of extinction? Perhaps it's best to begin with the link between population pressures and the loss of wildlife habitat. Shanghai is a mega city of steel and glass, the commercial and financial center of China fueled by around-the-clock images, symbols of consumption, powered by a global economy. Even when the glow of neon finally gives way to the sobering reality of daylight, nothing slows the city's booming economy. We've been saying that the United States, with 5% of the world's people, consumes a third to 40% of the, of the world's resources. That was true for a long time. It is no longer true. It is no longer true because China has now overtaken the United States in the consumption of most basic resources. We look at the food economy, grain and meat, and all those commodities now, China consumes more than the United States. And, and that could create a serious problem for the world. Shanghai's food markets overflow with fresh produce and once unimaginable luxuries like eggs, poultry, and meat. In fact, China accounts for more than one quarter of the world's consumption of meat. Simply put, 1.3 billion consumers can have a major impact on the world's economy. The windswept prairies of northeastern China have sustained herders and nomadic horsemen for thousands of years. Normally, they would stay in one location as long as there was enough grass and water for their animals. Then as the grass and ponds became exhausted, they would move their herds to new pastures. To exploit China's sudden and growing appetite for meat, the herders increased their cattle, sheep, and goats from 100 million head to over 400 million. But there's not enough pasture to support this increase in livestock. Extreme overgrazing has created a crisis. Without the protective cover of grass, the herders can't keep up with the demand for meat. This has forced the Chinese to increase their production of pork and poultry, requiring massive amounts of feed grain made from soybeans. But farmers can't meet the demand. And in their search for soybeans, China is, in a sense, burning up the forests of the world. Particularly, the rainforests of the Amazon. Each year, millions of acres go up in flames. The devastation caused by local farmers is unimaginable. Gone is irreplaceable habitat that helps support the greatest diversity of wildlife in the world. Gone is important genetic information of plants and animals that could lead to the development of new drugs and cures for diseases. And in its place are smoldering pockets of land. 
land that gives way to cattle pastures and soybean farms. But once it's cultivated, it doesn't take long before the nutrients of the forest floor become exhausted. Soon the land is abandoned. The ranchers and farmers move on and the burning begins again. Only this time, deeper into the rainforest. Signs of the devastation can be seen all along the region's major highway, the Amazon River. Timber, cut from the heart of the rainforest, heads downstream on the way to local sawmills and then onto North America. Cattle raised on exhausted farmland are destined for the food markets of Europe. And soybeans, grown on the charred remains of the forest floor, are loaded into cargo containers that make their way to the pig and poultry farms of Asia. As a result, Brazil has become the world's largest exporter of soybeans. And their biggest customer is China. In the era of globalization, deforestation is increasingly driven by the dinner tables of the world. And if 1.3 billion Chinese decide to eat more pork and poultry, but lack the land to grow soybeans, then the Amazon simply becomes their new farmland. The Amazon year after year is being eaten away by major deforestation. What we're getting closer and closer to is a tipping point which will affect the whole system. So if you do lose the entire Amazon, you're losing probably one-fifth of all the wildlife species on Earth. Though pressures from the world's most populated countries can lead to the loss of huge tracts of wilderness areas, even the least crowded regions are showing declines in wildlife habitat. South Africa is a country dominated by the timeless rhythms of nature. and the diversity of life found in the rolling hills of endless green. Its central highlands are an environmental treasure. This may be the oldest grassland habitat on the planet, so ancient that it existed before the Earth's original landmass broke off into continents over a hundred million years ago. Here, the word grassland is almost a misnomer. Only one in six plants are actually grasses. During the spring and summer months, over 800 species of wildflowers carpet the landscape, turning it into a delicate mosaic of pastels. The grasslands act like a giant sponge, a natural reservoir that soaks up water during the rainy season and slowly releases it during South Africa's long dry season. Small pockets of wetlands are home to some 360 species of birds. A sanctuary for migrating flocks from North Africa and Europe. The grasslands also provide fertile and abundant grazing for animals, both wild and domestic. Overgrazing and erosion have never been a problem. Until recently, this was an ecosystem in almost perfect balance. 
South Africa also represents a microcosm of a global debate. How best to balance badly needed economic development with the preservation of nature? These beautiful grasslands are one of the oldest landscapes in Africa, around about 180 million years. They used to cover as much as 60% of Africa, and today they're being threatened by all sorts of things, perhaps the most invasive or alien tree plantations to feed great big paper and pulp mills for Japan and the US. Along the edge of the grasslands, hundreds of thousands of acres have been turned into tree plantations. Logging has become a major industry in South Africa. These trees being harvested, mostly pine and eucalyptus, are not native to South Africa. But they are beginning to take over parts of the grasslands. They consume nearly 40% of available rainwater, water that is necessary to maintain the delicate balance of the ecosystem. But each year, less and less runoff finds its way into the wetlands, which has become an important stopover for hundreds of thousands of migrating birds. Clearly, economic development has put the wildlife that live in this ecosystem in jeopardy. About 2,000 miles to the north, a similar habitat story is playing out. Only this time, a local community may have found some answers. Kenya's Lake Baringo is also a refuge for migrating waterfowl. Yet its scenic beauty belies a harsh reality. Lake Baringo is dying. It's literally drying up. I was born and raised here in Lake Baringo. And the area that we're now standing on used to at one time be lake. Um, in fact, uh, there would have been about seven or eight feet of water here. Murray Roberts feels a strong bond to this place and its people. Over the years, he watched with dismay as this jewel of a lake turned brown, as it slowly lost volume. The lake is receiving about four million cubic meters of silt every year. And as the years go by, the lake goes further and further down, and the bottom of the lake comes further up. And the long-term prediction is that it will eventually become a swamp. Murray knows the reasons all too well. Increased agriculture has siphoned river water away from Baringo. Overgrazing has led to massive amounts of soil erosion and silting. Murray also knows that unless something is done very soon, the lake and the bird sanctuary will simply disappear. A few miles from Lake Baringo, a local tribesman has found a glimmer of hope. Paul Parcelock's life revolves around caring for his livestock. For as long as he can remember, the family's days have been defined by the herd's search for grass. Every time Paul crosses his ancestral territory, he's reminded of the conflicting pressures of the 21st century. As his Njem tribe became more sedentary, their livestock stripped away the grass near Lake Baringo. That's when he realized that time was running out for his family and for the lake. Paul and Murray Roberts teamed up to find a way to restore about 5,000 acres of denuded land surrounding the lake. The plan was simple. They agreed to plant only indigenous grasses, hardy species that bind eroded soils together and start the process of grassland regeneration. The community's efforts paid off. These sheaves of Aristida grass are being harvested and taken to a local market for sale as thatching and fodder. It's brought hope to a situation which seemed so desperate. 
with the togetherness of the family, with our reclaimed land, we will make a living. The family is going to have a, a good future. The restoration of the grassland is particularly beneficial to the wildlife that once thrived in this environment, like the weaver birds, who now have enough grass to build their nests. And thanks to the efforts of the local community, for now at least, thousands of migrating birds still flock to Lake Baringo. Despite the success at Lake Baringo, there still remains a fundamental question. How can economic development and the protection of wilderness areas coexist? It's a question dominating the future of one of the largest wetland ecosystems in North America. At first glance, Florida's Everglades seems like a forbidding primordial wilderness. An unspoiled breeding ground and nursery for plants and animals. Offering sanctuary to millions of migrating birds. However abundant the wildlife, this ecosystem which is as large as the state of Connecticut, is in peril. Close to 90% of the bird population is gone. Over a dozen Everglades animals are on the endangered species list. Once home to over 1,500 Florida panthers, today about 80 remain in the wild. This is also a place where bobcats sometimes confuse power lines for trees. And like the bobcat and panther, the Everglades is in trouble. 100 years ago, things were much different. That's when the seasonal rains were free to flow into the meandering rivers of central Florida. The water was cleansed by the natural filtering process of the surrounding wetlands. And as the rivers made their way south, they fed into the second largest freshwater lake within the borders of the United States, Lake Okeechobee. From there, the water slowly flowed across the marshlands, eventually giving life to the Everglades. But now the lake is surrounded, not by wetlands, but rather the urban sprawl of five million people. To meet the needs of an exploding economy, about 50% of Florida's original wetlands have been drained. It's water diverted into canals for flood control and to satisfy the thirsty demands of development and agriculture. But in return, cattle ranches and farms discharge the watery residue of agricultural chemicals, like phosphorus, into the major source of water for the Everglades, Lake Okeechobee. After decades of abuse, the lake is showing signs of severe damage. And wildlife are always the first to suffer. When you put a whole lot of phosphorus pollution in Lake Okeechobee and in the Everglades, the cattails take over everything. Basically, the cattails get so thick that no wildlife can live in there. There's, there's almost nothing that uh, feeds in cattail. The water underneath the cattails is low in oxygen. There aren't a lot of bugs down there and birds can't wade through there because it's too thick. Ducks can't swim in there because it's too thick and it just becomes kind of a biological desert out there. Although most biologists concede that the Everglades can never be returned to its original state, experts are developing plans to reverse the environmental damage and help is coming from an unlikely source. In Florida, cattle ranching is big business. It represents almost a half billion dollars in annual sales. 
For hundreds of years, there was always enough land for both wildlife and cattle. Recently, they've been competing for the same land and the same water. Not so on the Williamson Ranch. Located less than 15 miles from Lake Okeechobee, this is one of the most productive pieces of land in South Florida. A hundred years ago, much of the ranch's 8,000 acres was wildlife habitat. Sonny Williamson is a good steward of the land. He knows that something must be done to restore the Everglades. We're trying to find ways to uh, restore wetlands and to do it in a way that will really uh, benefit the water quality when it finally does leave the land and also to store the water there and not sort of pipeline it straight into Lake Okeechobee and pipeline it into the Everglades. What Sonny Williamson and some of his neighbors are doing is not channeling their tainted agricultural runoff back into the lake, but rather holding it on the land and turning unused portions of their property into wildlife sanctuaries. Only after the ecosystem naturally filters out the chemical residue is the water allowed to flow into Lake Okeechobee. And in the process, new wetlands have been created, habitats that are essential for the preservation of wildlife. It's a program that's good for the environment and economically sustainable for the ranchers. Our connection with nature is extremely important, I believe. And I don't know what happens to the human being when he's completely urbanized, but I don't really want to be around when that happens. Clearly, the greatest challenge for the future of South Florida is finding a balance between rapid urbanization and the need to save the Everglades. But elsewhere in the world, poverty and hunger play an equally dramatic role in the loss of wildlife. A South African lumber mill hasn't had a job opening for nearly a year. The hours are long, and the pay is marginal. Yet each morning, the plant manager must turn away dozens of applicants. Some of the men came to me from homes that literally had no food at all, and they said, we're quite happy to work just for food alone. If you'll just give us food, and we will show you that we can work. And, and, and um, after the second or third month, if you feel we're worth our wage, please pay us. I had to very sadly turn people away, and it's a heart-rendering exercise to go through and ask these folk to leave because you just haven't got work for them. And some of the men actually said, you don't know how hungry we are. We desperately need food. Many move to urban centers in search of work. But the big cities of Africa have little to offer the rural poor. Nairobi is ringed with impoverished shanty towns like Kibera. Over 700,000 migrants live in squalor. There are very few job opportunities. Unemployment is over 80%. Here in Kibera, hunger is a stark reality. Yet just a few miles away, animals are free to roam on a protected game preserve. But when people are hungry, wildlife become targets of opportunity. It's happening all over the world. Each year, millions of animals are killed so the poor can earn enough for the bare necessities of life. While the world's tigers are going extinct. Each year, millions of animals are killed to feed the hungry. While the world's primates are going extinct.
Each year, millions of animals become trophies for the wealthy. while their body parts are turned into remedies and tonics. Each year, hundreds of millions of animals are caged and sold as exotic pets. And the loss of bird species is astonishing. The epicenter of the world's wild bird trade is here, in the back alleys and markets of Singapore. Located in the heart of Southeast Asia, this is where hundreds of thousands of rare and exotic birds are bought and sold. Singapore's active harbor reflects the enormous profits that come from liberal trading policies. But it's from its international airport that the rarest of animals are shipped to the wealthy markets of Europe and North America. In an age of globalization, wildlife trade has turned into a $6 billion a year industry. What we're essentially doing is creating what's known as the empty forest syndrome. And this means that we're getting forests which look fantastic, they're full of wonderful trees, but they're losing their wildlife from inside them because it's being hunted out and that means that we're losing pollinators, dispersers, browsers, and that's likely to have a domino effect within the forest and will cause other species to go too, including species which are very important for medicines, for timber. So if we lose those animals, the wider repercussions for the whole ecosystem could be very significant indeed, and we don't know the full ramifications of it. Wild species are facing the prospect of a kind of demographic winter, a period of time in which there are so many human beings on the planet and their economic needs are so great that they've so dominated the planet that it's very difficult for wildlife to survive. Fortunately, there are many places in the world where community initiatives can lead to global solutions. In the African nation of Zambia, there is such a program. Thirty-five years ago, the Luangwa Valley was a 3,000 square mile protected sanctuary for about 90,000 elephants. But when drought and famine overwhelmed the local farmers, the valley became less like a wildlife preserve and more like a war zone. The elephant population was hunted for food and tusks. Despite a ban on the sale of ivory, their numbers dropped to fewer than 15,000. And as poverty deepened, elephants continued to be slaughtered at the rate of over a thousand a year. In the face of poverty, people will tend to utilize whatever they can to survive, and that makes perfect sense. Our job as conservationists is to try and create environments where sustainable management is possible, where people can see things from a larger scale and learn how to manage things, not just at the household level, but work collaboratively to manage things at a landscape level. Organizers realized that the villagers needed economic incentives before they would agree to stop poaching. And there was one condition. They had to turn in their snares and guns. We've had over 30,000 snares turned over. Hundreds of guns have been turned in because farmers have seen that by new ways of managing their agricultural output and new marketing strategies, they don't need to poach. Poaching is a food security issue, and I, I, even the term poaching is, is a loaded one. It's, it's, it's something people need to do when they're starving, when they need to feed their families. The results are impressive. In three years, 16,000 farmers have achieved food security. Wildlife is coming back. The elephant population is increasing. And the economic benefits of ecotourism are on the rise. The challenge for nations of the world is to somehow duplicate Zambia's success. But it won't be easy especially when an even greater threat to the state of the planet's wildlife 
is looming on the horizon. From the air, the world's glaciers are an extraordinary sight. A treasure of natural beauty. With endless formations of ice and snow, seemingly frozen in time. But now take a closer look. Something seems to be going wrong. The world's glacial regions are melting. And it's because of human changes to our environment. We now live in a world where ice and snow are melting at unprecedented rates. And where temperatures are rising faster than at any time in recorded history. In Montana's Glacier National Park, about 150 years ago, there were over 150 active glaciers. Today, there are 27. In a few decades, scientists tell us, they'll be gone. In South America, the glaciers of the tropical Andes are also melting. The alarming fact is that they are melting three times faster than they were 50 years ago. Parts of Africa are also showing the effects of climate change. Mount Kilimanjaro dominates Tanzania's landscape. Its peak has been covered with ice and snow for nearly 11,000 years. But recent satellite images show a dramatic melting of its glaciers. Scientists now expect that they will be completely gone by the year 2020. The melting of the world's glaciers is also an early warning signal, a vivid reminder that the sixth extinction could be only decades away. Yet there is a place where it may have already begun, and it's happening in one of the world's coldest regions, the Arctic. Climate change is not a theory, it's a reality here in the Arctic. Um, we are getting uh, ice forming much later in the year and breaking up much earlier in the year. Uh, we're getting insects uh, that have never been up here in the Arctic before. We're getting birds, species of birds and fish that have not been up here before. Our whole world is being altered up here in the Arctic and I think the world has to pay heed to that. For polar bears, climate change may be a death sentence. To hunt for seals, which is their primary source of food, the bears must first swim long distances until they find stable sea ice. Without the ice, the bears cannot survive. Their hunting technique is simple. The bears stake out breathing holes carved out by seals. They wait until the seals must come up for air. And when they do, the bears pounce. Polar bears spend months gorging themselves. They hunt with a sense of urgency. know that when the sea ice melts, they must go months without food until the ice returns. But now scientists say their frozen habitat is rapidly warming, and the Arctic Ocean could be ice-free within decades. Without ice flows to hunt seals from, the polar bear will surely become extinct. Though the bears can swim nonstop for as long as 100 miles, already many are drowning from sheer exhaustion in their desperate search for sea ice. 
we have some significant challenges ahead of us. I think global climate change is going to turn everybody on their heads. What areas will become richer in wildlife? What areas will become more barren? In a world already experiencing the warmest years on record, the threat of climate change leading to a sixth extinction is getting stronger. Here's a snapshot of the future, a look at how global warming could affect wildlife in a place already on the edge, Africa. As temperatures rise, pastures for livestock dry up. Rural villages begin to suffer. Human migration into cities intensifies. Unemployment and poverty deepens. Elephants invade farms in search of food. And if the heat and drought doesn't wipe out half of Africa's wildlife, surely the poachers will. Even those who voluntarily turned in their guns in the Luangwa Valley of Zambia. Though the full impact of climate change may be decades away, wildlife habitats continue to deteriorate at alarming rates. This leaves animals with few options, either face extinction or migrate to safer wilderness areas. But too often these wildlife corridors are blocked by human development. These wildlife corridors would have to displace farms, interstate highways, in some cases entire metropolitan areas. That's not going to happen. Uh, so we have a real dilemma of how we can actually make the world um, a, a more compatible place for threatened plants and animals to ideally survive, uh, and if not survive, uh, to find some nearby place where they can survive. We have to move past the old model of having isolated national parks and wildlife preserves here and there not connected with the rest of nature uh, and so basically it's really important to stitch these all together into uh, a sort of a, a matrix with corridors running between protected areas. They call this the Rocky Mountain Front. It's where the grasslands of the Great Plains meet the towering peaks of the Rocky Mountains. Located in northwestern Montana, this is a gateway to one of the largest wilderness areas in the United States. This is also where grizzly bears still roam free. Two hundred years ago, the West was home to over 100,000 bears. Today, there are about a thousand. Human development has turned their feeding grounds into suburban backyards. And public sentiment threatens to exile the grizzly bear to isolated wildlife preserves. Yet it is here, in these remaining patches of wilderness, that these endangered grizzly bears must make their last stand. In a world where game preserves offer little protection, there is a place where much is being done to keep wildlife corridors open. Montana's Blackfoot River Valley is a community of about 2,500 families. Most are ranchers. And they treasure a rural lifestyle that hasn't changed very much for generations. Through the center of their valley, runs the crystal clear waters of the Blackfoot River. Celebrated in the book and movie, A River Runs Through It. I think Norman McLean's phrase, the river runs through it, is so, uh, is so true because it binds the people of the community together. Some people use it for agricultural purposes, others use it for recreational purposes. It's a thing that brings us together. What also brought the community together 
was the fact that their beloved river was surrounded by one of the most robust grizzly bear habitats in the country. The Blackfoot Valley lies at the southern edge of what we call the Crown of the Continent ecosystem, which includes Glacier National Park and the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Um, unfortunately, that high area is at such a high elevation that it doesn't have the most productive lands. And so critters like grizzly bears, while they winter up there, they hibernate up in that high country, they need to come down on these valley floors in the springtime and particularly the fall time for foraging reasons. Several decades ago, the community decided they'd rather live with grizzly bears than cut off their wildlife corridors and isolate them into extinction. To help save the bears, they formed a grassroots alliance called the Blackfoot Challenge. Where, where grizzly bears and cattle, you know, both share habitat, there's conflict. Our ancestors got rid of that by getting rid of the, the grizzly bears. Uh, what we're trying to figure out now is how we can have both cattle and grizzly bears. This jack leg fence that we constructed in 1990 allows for wildlife migration, such as grizzly bears, to pass through this area while preventing domestic livestock from accessing this riparian area. This is the only bull trout spawning site we have in the whole Blackfoot Valley that's located on private property. And thanks to the rancher here, who's allowed this management change, we have a healthier habitat to a whole host of critters, from grizzly bears to migratory songbirds to uh, bull trout that spawn in the stream system. The community also turned their attention to the grizzly bear's most important habitat, the vast tracts of forest that surrounded the valley. In the past, clear-cutting wiped out huge sections of woodlands. For decades, old growth trees were torn from the valley's slopes. But in the process, tens of thousands of acres of wildlife habitat were sacrificed to meet the nation's growing demand for wood. The sounds of logging still echo through the Blackfoot River Valley. But today, trees are harvested using newer techniques. Rather than indiscriminate clear cutting, the forest is thinned out. Left behind is a healthier and larger habitat for birds and other animals especially for grizzly bears. To help avoid serious confrontations between humans and bears, a local biologist keeps track of their migration patterns. Grizzlies have always been back in the Bob Marshall Wilderness. In the last 10 years or so, they've started to come out here on the south end. And uh, a lot of this is private land, and a lot of it is land that uh, hasn't had grizzly bear activity in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, but they're starting to move back in. At times, Jamie Jonkel uses radio collars and tracking devices to monitor the more active bears. We have a large male grizzly, uh, male 107, that's on the ranch right now. He came down here about a month ago um, just because it's a good place to come if you're a bear. And uh, he's very close, and uh, his signal's just booming in. It sounds like he's about a quarter mile away. And they kind of uh, come off the mountain face here and they come down into the flats. But uh, he's definitely down here on the ranch. For the people living in the Blackfoot River Valley, the decision to keep their land open to wildlife corridors seemed like the most logical choice. I think the greatness about being here in the Blackfoot and being part of this system that we still have all these critters together really means that we've got an intact landscape and it means something bigger than just those critters. Thanks to a community's deeply held respect for the natural world, 
the grizzly bears of the Blackfoot Valley are doing well. But there still remains a larger and more serious question. On a planet teetering on the brink of the sixth extinction, are the grizzly bears and all the other animals living in the natural world ultimately doomed to survive only as popular attractions in our zoos? The large cats, the, the tigers, are a terrible risk. And zoos may be the last place where there are genetically pure representatives of these species. But will they be wild animals? For me, they won't be. They'll be an aberration. They'll be the remnants of human thoughtlessness and inability to heal the planet. However difficult it is to protect wildlife, it's a testament to the power of human ingenuity that we are finding ways to coexist with the animals of the natural world. But in the end, perhaps the biggest challenge to the state of the planet's wildlife is recognizing the seriousness of the problems that lie ahead. The state of the planet's wildlife at the moment is very alarming. Some species are going so fast and we either need to do something about it very quickly or we're going to start seeing some pretty massive extinctions of species that we really care about. But it's going to be a horse race between those changes that will be irreparable and our ability to do good and alter the way that we use the resources on our planet. I would say that the state of the planet's wildlife is precarious and I think the decisions we make uh, in the next few years will be very important in terms of determining which way things go. The urgency to avoid a sixth extinction presents us with enormous challenges. What we need now are the efforts of people everywhere. All those who are willing to find ways to strike the right balance between what we want and what our planet's wildlife can endure. Though separated by distance and culture, for the six and a half billion people who draw sustenance from the rich diversity of the natural world, there are common bonds. Bonds that are renewed by each generation, bringing new ideas, new attitudes, new hope for the state of the planet's wildlife. Planet Earth, this is our home. This is where our journey of discovery must begin. To discover more about today's featured stories, educational resources, or download teacher's guides and other information about the environment, please join me on the Journey to Planet Earth website at pbs.org.